Hi folks and welcome to this episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. Today we're going to cover cover several topics. Uh, as you've seen, if you've been following my videos, uh, part four, where this is going to be part five, we're going to put some shelving up. I'm going to show you how to install a nice heavy duty corner shelf that you can put some things on, store some things uh, in a space that you would otherwise go unused and show you the type of materials that I'm going to be using that I have gotten for little to no money into because uh, that's the best way is just to be patient, collect things over time, and then use them as uh, as needed. Also going to cover the Dyna Glow Heater and how it's been performing in my shop. I got my I went online and looked at my first electric bill after having this thing installed, and woo, that's crazy. Anyway, but that was why, while I was not fully insulated, and I was spending about uh, three weeks to get this thing fully insulated and sealed off better, uh, I'm currently, this morning, it's 24 degrees outside, I believe, yeah, 24 degrees outside. It's running about 55.4 degrees inside right now. And so about a 31 degree difference between outside to inside. I'm going to be tracking while I'm doing this other stuff this morning with you on this video. We're going to be tracking the cycles on and off. And I'll be able to I'll calculate and tell you and show you how I calculate the electrical usage and the cost. Uh, what I should be normally seeing month over month. Uh, trying to maintain a certain level of comfort in my shop. So that'll be interesting. It's going to be some math today, folks. I'm sorry. We're going to have to do some math. Uh, five out of four people say math is hard. Got you there. Think about it for a second. So I'm going to show you some of the other stuff we're going to do today. So we've been slowly but surely cleaning up the marina shop. My workbench is now pretty much cleaned off on top with only what I want on it or what needs to be repaired on top of it. My chop saw bench that I made many years ago, uh, I have now emptied off all the shelves. I am going to put all my nailing and fastening type uh well just nails nail guns and nails and uh on the, this shelf and take advantage of that space because all i had before there was little scraps of wood and junk and let's use it for some good storage space we'll finish cleaning off my saw there's a whole bunch of stuff below my saw i want to get that cleaned off to, out today and let's wander over here i've got my corner that have has been a collection of mess uh, you guys saw in the cabinet that I moved this cabinet out and put it back. It's just full. It's covered. Uh, I'm going to get that sorted and cleaned out so it's organized like I want it to be. I'm going to put a corner shelf up here, a big corner shelf. I've got these boards. These are old countertops, uh, workbench tops that were no longer being used. They got replaced by butcher blocks uh, style tops. And I've got a big piece here that's about six foot uh, wide is probably three feet deep. I'm going to show you how I'm going to turn that into a corner shelf up here. Take advantage of this dead space. I've got a lot of ceiling space above my door here that I can take advantage of that I'm not going to do anything else with. So I'm going to put a shelf up there. Coming down here, I've got this big open area underneath my bench that has my belt sander, my drum sander, and my uh, router that's back here, and my bandsaw. But this space under here is poorly used. So, what I'm going to do there is I'm going to add another shelf in between so I can divide my storage space up and hopefully finish cleaning up the rest of my shop. And then if we have time today, we're going to convert my sanding bench here, which is a laminate top itself, but has a little bit of a, I don't know if you can see it there, there's a little bit of a, a curve to it. It's kind of like starting to sway a little bit because it is just particle board countertop. I have a piece of 3 8 I believe, thick steel that I'm going to replace <clears throat> place it with. And then I'll have a nice steel top. And this is my homemade uh, belt sander here. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but I uh, built it with the intention of doing some knife making. And eventually I'll get to that project. Uh, but it's a quick release belt sander that I can change belts on it uses a long belt uh, I was going to purchase I will eventually purchase a big like eight inch rubber wheel I think I designed it for to go here so when I flip this around I could run a big rubber wheel and but it would be nicer if it was on a steel top you can see right there I've got it set up with a four-step pulley here so I can change the speeds if I wanted to 
uh, and change the grit and all that fun stuff. Anyway, we're going to convert that to a steel top, hopefully today. So we've got a lot of things going on today. we got a good start this morning. We're out here just after sun up. And let's get busy with some organization first. And then we'll do some math a little later on after I gather some more data. Okay, let's do a quick recap of how the corner shelf was built. As you can see, strong. I can, I can hang on it if I wanted to. Not a problem. It is 2x4 construction. The, the beauty of this design is it is simple and it is crazy strong because it is fastened to the wall. So the shear strength is, is a, enormous right there along the wall to try to, if you put weight up there, it would have to shear the screws off to, to break. So it's got a lot of holding strength there without any bracing that you need. The nice thing about this board here is it's going to give it strength across the front. This is just particle board, so over time it would sag. With this 2 by here, typically it would not sag over time. Uh, the, I'm, uh, put the two uh, biter cut at 45 degrees on both of these 2 by 4s in the back. So then when I lay this one up front... It would lay tight against that board. I 45 degrees the ends so they would lay tight up against the wall. I put one screw this direction and two screws this direction to hold this board in place as well. And then obviously this here is six foot across the front, right across the front here. It's three foot deep. It's a 45 degree angle, so it's three foot deep back to the back corner. This is a lot of unused space that you would have in your shop. And up front here, I have 10 foot ceilings because of the slope of the roof. So this allows me to have plenty of space to store stuff. As you can see, I've got my leaf blower sitting up there. And what I would normally store up there would be the, the not regularly used things, the things I'd use once every two to three weeks. So, because um, they're the stuff I want to have at a ground level to use uh, more often, or whatever is at the ground level is stuff that I would use more often. So yeah, I'm pretty tickled with that shelf. I can put all kinds of whatever I want to store up there now. And it's going to be secure. It's off the floor. It's out of the way. It's with a little step stool. I can get up there and grab the stuff. Anyway, you got any questions, leave comments. I can, I can answer them. But like I said, it's a real simple design. I've done this in several shops that I've been in. And it's just a, a nice, quick, easy way to put a clean looking shelf up in a corner and take advantage of space you would not normally be using. So let's, let's keep working on today's projects.
Okay, now we're gonna talk about the Dyna Glow electric furnace, which has two settings, 7,500 watt and 5,000 watt. And we're gonna talk about its power consumption. Let's talk about that now. All right, <clears throat> I knew when I installed this electric furnace that it would my electric bill would go up. And I also installed it before my shop was finished. As you can see, my last electric bill I just received was $269.13 for December. I went back and looked at the history of the rest of my December bills and as you can see they averaged for the rest of them they averaged 135.01 each. So I've had an increase of $134 on my last bill over the average. So yes the like the electric furnace does consume a decent amount of electricity. I also understand that the that I was only on for about two and a half to three weeks before I had the shop completely insulated so I was heating a, a wide open tin can pretty much for the most part. Now that it's fully sealed, I did some tracking. And I was tracking the, let's see here, where did I put it? I was tracking the amount of time uh, on or that it was off, then when it turned on, then when it turned off. Anyway, I came up with some numbers. So I know for a fact now that to, make, to maintain about a 30 degree difference between inside and outside, it is, uh, let's see here, it spends about 82% of, I said, oh, here's what I come up with, 79% of its time off, 21% of its time on. So I could use those percentages, and that's per hour. Now, the one thing you can, uh, if you know you have a uh, 7,500 watt, or 75, what do I want to call, uh, 7,500 watt uh, heater that's going to be 7.5 kilowatts it will use per hour so and i was looking at my last bill and my last bill was 269.13 my usage was 2135 uh, kilowatt hours so that comes out to point one two cents a uh, one two six uh or 12.6 cents a kilowatt hour is my consumption or 0.016 per minute. Uh, so like I said here, 75 watt kilowatt, 7,500 watt kilowatt heater is uh, gonna be 7.5 kilowatts per hour times 12.6, uh, yeah, 12.6 cents, uh, which will equal 94.5 cents an hour to run. So, or 22.6 hours a day, or $680, yeah, $22.68 a day, or $680 per month. And that's if it ran 24 seven for 30 days. And I just based it on 30 days. So with that information being known, I figured up my time on and time off. So I know that it would cost me, let's see here, back to this again, 94, um, uh, 94 and a half cents per hour. Well, I take that times my, it's only on 21% of an hour. So once I do that 21% of an hour, quick math says it's gonna cost, which I did here, it's gonna cost me 20 cents per hour to run, uh, or 4.83 per day, or $145 per month, which is really close to this 136, or 134, dollars and 12 cents that it did cost me for the three weeks. So it's not really crazy cheap. Now, if it cycles on and off at the same rate, which I did test and it does seem to cycle on and off at the same rate for some reason, with just on the 5,000 uh, kilowatt setting, then it's only gonna cost me $95.70 a month to run this furnace. Now keep in mind, typically, I'm not running the furnace in, until like December. We've had a pretty warm December, but I'm gonna be running it in December, January, and February. March, it starts to warm up again around here. Uh, and I'm basically just keeping the garage above freezing. So for quick calculations for you guys, figure out the kilt, like I said again, let's go back through it one more time real quick. If you got, look into the consumption of your uh, electrical, item and it could be a hair dryer it can be a whatever you're consuming you can figure out what it's going to cost you to run it 
per minute easily enough because we know that 7,500 kilowatts equals 7.5 kilowatt hours. We know how many how much the electric company charges us, charges us for per kilowatt hour. Take that, multiply it by the time it's on, and that's what it's costing you to run it. Very simple. So I don't know if that's helpful for anybody out there. Uh, if you're trying to figure out what your power consumption is going to be. But uh, that's how I did it. Anyway, let's get back to doing some more cleaning and organizing. I hope you found that information helpful. But that's a simple and easy way to figure out how much power you're going to consume and is it worth it to you. Now, this is also keeping my shop at right now at 62 degrees out here, which is a little warmer than I like it. Um, but that was to keep it this morning for two hours straight. I, I monitored it. There's no difference as the day went on. It ran about the same amount. It just increased the temperature difference uh, because the way this Dynaglow is set up, it doesn't have it. It has a thermostat, pseudo thermostat on the front. It's supposed to hold a certain temperature, which it does pretty good for the most part, but it warms up outside. It also warms up a little more inside. I'm going to eventually, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to eventually put a regular home thermostat on there that I can just say, hold it at 45 or hold it at 50. And the nice thing about electric furnace, I got to get a thermostat that'll go down. I would like to hold the, the building at 40. That keeps everything in here from freezing, which is all I'm after. As long as it doesn't freeze, none of my paints and none of my other things will get destroyed over the winter. Plus it would cost, if I'm going to not be in my shop for two to three to four days or weeks at a time, it's going to be minimal cost. Those costs that I got here are going to be my maximum cost. My minimum cost, uh, or it'd be minimal if I run it to the bottom end of the temperature range. So with that being said, I got a little more cleaning up to do on my saw bench here or my table saw underneath this kind of a mess. I did not get to my converting my other bench to a steel bench today. We'll do that on another video, but uh, we're having some fun out here. We've got some good things done. We now have my corner shelf with some stuff on it to, to help clear up off, things off my floor. We've got this shelf a lot better organized. We've got this shelf uh, with another shelf in it, this cabinet with another shelf in it so I can organize that better. So the entire shop is actually getting a lot cleaner. We just got a little bit of a hot mess over here to clean up and we will be 95% clean and organized in this shop. So let's get after it. unfortunate incident happened to my shop back we know in a few days a few videos ago I got the new attachments and the one attachment with the curved attachment I had I went to turn it off with this other thing in my hand and lo and behold a switch that's 30 plus years old I broke off because I hit it with that attachment so we're gonna see what it's gonna take to take this apart to get at that switch to replace it
Well, that was easy to get at. It's just a press-in switch right there. I'm pretty sure I could get another one of those online. Pretty quick and easy. Let's see if we can get this one out. There we go. I'm pretty sure if I look this up dimensionally, a carling switch. I bet I can find one of those online pretty easy. Get it ordered. And put it in and have this bad boy back fixed again. So we're going to leave that apart right there. We'll go in and see what we can find for parts. Okay, everybody. Well, we saw me take this apart. Let me get it back off here. This is where the original switch was located, which is this switch right here. I got online. Yes, I can find the switch. I found a place that had it available. It's actually quite a few places did not have it available. Showed it listed, but unavailable. Sad news is the one place I found it at, it was like 12 something for the switch. Tax was a dollar certain thirty something. Shipping was it was going to be twenty bucks, twenty bucks for this little plastic switch that just goes right in here and goes snap. But as you can see here, and twenty bucks, I can get a brand new sixteen gallon Craftsman brand. Shop bag, which is what this is, this is Craftsman, really old, but for about 150. So 20 bucks for a switch when I get a whole new one for 150, and I was like, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. So I started looking through my stuff. What did I find? A push pull on off switch. Bam to bam to bam to bam to bam to bam. So I am going to go ahead and solder on some lugs. So that I can put this right on here, put this right on here. I'm gonna drill, I got lots of real estate under here. Cause this is, this diameter here fits right here, inside here. I've got lots of real estate around here to modify it. What's funny is this looks all vented and everything, but it's actually only vented through here. But I got plenty of room along here to drill a hole, stick this on off switch, right up through the hole, on, bam, off. So let's get started on that. And this, I had in stock, it is free. Let's get busy doing what we're doing. Well, just like that, folks, I drilled a hole in here. You saw I soldered some connectors on, and then... For no cost to me, just a little bit of time. My wonderful shop vac is back up in business and ready to clean up some gritty, nasty dirt.
so I drink a lot. Okay, folks, thanks for hanging out with me this long. I know we've been covering a few different things throughout the video. We fixed my shop back. We've cleaned up some areas. We've organized and built some corner shelves and organized some other cabinets. Uh, I've got another thing I want to do for you. Okay, it's not for you, but just to include you in, I bought me a thermostat that in some 18-2 wire to hook up a, a remote thermostat to my Dynaglow furnace. We covered the cost of the Dynaglow. It's been working great. It does a good job. It's keeping it warm in here. It's currently 53 degrees in here because that's approximately where I have it set. Let's take a look real, real quick and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, I'm gonna show you here on this one. It has a dial. This old uh, Dynaglow here has a dial that is technically a thermostat, but it doesn't tell you what the temperature settings are. So just like this here, I can turn it. It kicks on. I can turn it to wide open. Let it run until the next therm. I got a little atomic clock over here that shows what temperature it is in here. And once it hits a certain temperature that I like, I can take this and just turn it down and turn it real slow until you hear it click off. Once it clicks off, it will hold that temperature all day long. And just like it is right now, I just clicked it off. It's 53 out here. It'll hold 52 to 53 within a couple degrees all day, all night long as a result. But I would like to have a thermometer or my external thermostats thermostat so I can just set a temperature versus guessing. So if I come out here and I go, hey, I want it to come up to 55, I set it at 55, I don't have to play around with that dial. And I have to, in watching this, I just set it at 55, it'll work. So that's what we're gonna do this morning. So in this particular model uh, furnace, it has a switch in the back that will switch it to its internal thermostat, or you flip the switch and hook these, hook the wiring up into two leads that go into the, into the unit and it'll switch it to an external thermostat. So the kind of the neat thing about that is if this thing happens to go haywire on me, I can actually just flip the switch in the back and I'm back to the uh, factory thermostat that's built into the unit. So that's a plus, I guess. Uh, I'm hoping this one will work. I picked it up. These were only about 18 to 20 bucks. I uh, didn't need anything fancy. As you can see here, it uh, has on, off, and auto, or fan, auto, on, or the fan, I guess. Yeah, you can turn it on, on, whatever. And then you got heat and cool. I don't need cool. I just got the heat side. But uh, very simple. Nothing fancy. It's not programmable per se. Um, it's just, I just wanted a digital one just because. Uh, you can still, you could go do the old style one if you wanted to. But this is what I wanted. So I'm hoping it's got the wiring hookups I need inside. I think it does. It says it should work for it. So we're going to hook it up. And uh, then, I'll, then I'll retrace the wiring and show you what I did to hook it up. So let's get after that. First thing we're gonna do is see what we have in the contents of the package. Pretty simple, nothing fancy. Looks like it has a little doohickey there to peel off. This looks like it should open up like that. Looks like you got your mounting screws on the wall. And a couple of hookup connection, connections there. So I'm probably going to have to read the instructions. Looks like it takes two AA batteries. So let's figure out where I want to mount this and get this part mounted to the wall. And then we run our wires into it and go from there.
Okay, once you've got your wall mount backing mounted to the wall, next thing you need to do is run your wiring. Now right here on this furnace, there has uh, a one and a two here. And it shows in the instructions, that's where you hook up an external thermostat wire is on your one and a two. So that's what I did there. Ran it out of the back of the unit along the wall. So pretty straightforward there. So over here is your L1 and L2 as your lanes coming in for 220. Over here is the one and the two is for the thermostat. The other thing you do on this unit is you have to flip this switch from heater's thermostat to external, external thermostat. So you turn that to there. After that, it says to turn your knob to wide open. So that's always on. Now, whether you want to run 7,500 watt or 5,000 watt, that's your choice. Now, once that's been done, let's go over here to the thermostat. I've got my wire routed coming into, into here. Now, this particular one, it's hard to see it here, but there's an RH behind here. And there's a W here. And it's, from what I gather, it looks like I'm supposed to hook the red into here and the white into here. And then there's this black jumper that stays there. Now, once I've got that done, I've installed my two batteries into the back. As you can see here, it now has power. And we'll go ahead and snap this in place. Yep, we're snapped in place there, and we'll go turn the uh, power on. I'm gonna go ahead and have, this is in the off position heat. This is on auto, but make sure this is off. So what I'm gonna do is now go turn my breaker back on. Breaker's on, nothing should come on yet, except for the orange light that's up there that says everything's cool. So now I'm gonna, okay, on this particular thermostat, there is, uh, this one is seven day programmable, which I'm not gonna use. I don't see any need to use it. I've got it set to heat now. So we flipped it uh, back to heat and we've got it on auto. And then right now it's saying it's 63 degrees out here. I can override it and go ahead and take it on up to, let's just say 68, 69 degrees and once that locks in boom you hear it click on and now it's going to come up and hold 68 69 degrees right there i like it that way because i can actually go ahead and turn it down to the slowest setting or wherever i want it without having to worry about programming all seven days and have it running when i'm not here or doing whatever when i'm not here i just prefer to have it that way so we're gonna let that run and see if it comes up to temp and shuts off Okay, folks, that's how you hook up the furnace. Now, every furnace could be different. Please don't take what I did as gospel. Follow your instructions. Have a professional install it if you don't know what you're doing. I'm not a professional. I don't claim to be. I just, I'm just i just kind of a handyman. So, furnace is installed. The other cool part about the remote thermostat is you want to put it, as you can see over here, I've got it over here next to the window, which they probably say it's not a great place to put it. But also that's kind of like a worst case scenario. I've got the furnace here blowing toward the front of the garage. And then the heat's got to come all the way around and then come back and warm up that area. So that has, it actually hold the temperature better, uh, more consistent without it. You don't want this over there with it on the far side of the garage and the heater blowing toward it. Then it turns off, then it turns right back on. You want it to cycle properly. So that's, what, that's why I decided to put it right there. I've done that in my other shops that I've had. And you want to put the thermostat somewhere opposite of the blowing direction. So it actually really does bring the whole room temperature up and stabilize at that level. And the other nice thing about, you know, this furnace here had a built-in thermostat that I showed you. Now, the cool part is if I come out here one day, my batteries are dead. Now, batteries in these things last a long time. Uh, I think I just finally replaced the ones in my house and it's been like almost five years, I think. But I had, uh, if the batteries were to go dead, and I didn't have any more batteries and I wanted to fire my furnace up and it won't fire up. The nice thing about this, all I gotta do is go on that backside. And, I can't get my fingers to go where I want them to go here. On the backside here and flip that switch. And then I can use the, the thermostat that's built onto it, no problem. So that's kind of a nice thing, it's kind of a backup that way. So anyway, 
let's get on busy. We got, got some more stuff we got to get done today. I'll walk you through some of the things I'm working on there too. So that's the thermostat, the long and the short of it. It's installed, the wiring is routed, and we're ready to just use the thermostat to keep temperature in the garage. So now I've got a planer that my uh, brother-in-law had uh, a break on him, and I'm gonna show you what happened to it and how I'm gonna fix it. Well, the next thing we're gonna talk about today is my brother-in-law had his win thickness planer break on him, and it broke. I'll see if I can show you here. This is very small. There's a little tiny socket head cap screw that broke. And I'll show you where it broke off from. Under here, so we can get you in the shot here, there are bevel gears that ride right here. Get them lined up. They got a, you can see there's a flat, um, the shape of that. It's round on the back side, but then it goes to that shape on the inside. The shaft matches so they can actually drive it. Well, what had happened, I don't know what happened. It's one of those things when you get something um, that you're working on that broke, you don't know why it broke. Uh, I have no idea why this one broke. The thinnest, the thinnest stuff you're supposed to plane with this is a half inch according to the what I looked up online. And if you tried to crank down to go below half inch, this is just a plastic gear. It's not gonna take a lot of uh, resistance to strip it out, and that's what happened. If you look at the, it's hard to see it in this one, but the flat in here is gone except for the last little tiny bit. So it stripped out the gear. I have seen the other planers at the store that these gears are actually made out of a cast material. Might be a little stronger, a little more durable. Maybe this is a, des a design to failure point for this. I don't know. Uh, so you don't mess something else up. But when I got it, one side, and I've got it straightened back out a little bit now, and you can see it's still crooked. One side was up about an inch further than the other side. So it was being cranked on and cranked on, but nothing was moving. The gear was stripped. and But even when that gear stripped, that gear, all that does is transfer through this shaft to the other side. You can still crank this, and this side here will still, this side over here, will still go up and down because it's still hooked to the screw. The other, And it needs to transfer to the other lifting screw on this other side right here to be able to do lifting so it lifts it simultaneously. And uh, this pitch of this screw is designed that every revolution of this handle will raise or lower lower the uh, planer blades one sixteenth of an inch is what it's designed, designed to do. So what we're gonna do here is a little trick that I'll share with you. I got that bolt taken out. And it was, the nice thing is I was able to take the bolt out of the other side of the little bolt like this, and I can actually take a measurement on it. I determined that it was a four millimeter by 0.7 pitch, and it's 10 millimeters long. Nice thing is I could go to the hardware store, and they sell them. In those little pullout bins, they had, they're fitting where the little general store or hardware store I went to, uh, 59 cents a piece. So I bought three of them. And you guys ask, why'd you buy three? Because I drop stuff, I lose stuff. So I buy one to use and two to lose. And that way I don't have to go back to the store in case I drop one and it falls down the crack in the floor or it just disappears. So now my challenge is to get the timing back. Because what I did is I took this shaft loose just so that the, I could move these screws independently of one another. So we're gonna go back to the level mode here. And now I need to determine how I'm gonna get this opening uniform. Cause I can turn these screws right now independently. I can take this one and raise it up and I can, just like you see it, it's probably hard to see there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna raise this up. I'm gonna use the front edge here. This is a granite plate that they actually use on the bottom of these. So I'm gonna grab a parallel So I have a matched set of parallels here that I can actually 
crank this up and crank this up. And I'm having to turn this one by grabbing onto the screw to turn it. But I'm going in the upward direction. So the pressure is with the motor hanging on it. And I'm going to crank this up. And I'm going to put a little pressure on the parallel so that when it just slides in over here, we got a little ways to go yet. Now, as you can see right here, that one just went in. Now I've got to bring this one up so it will just go in. There, that just goes in there now. Okay, I have it, I have it, what I feel somewhat is parallel up here. I'm gonna go ahead and install the bevel gears here. And tighten them down. That's in a good snug position. Now these have They sent a whole bearing kit. Because when it broke, they actually sent a nice little kit uh, free of charge, my understanding. So it looks like one washer goes behind that, another washer goes, or then the gear goes in place. And then this other thicker washer goes in front and traps it down. Is that turned and I don't want it to turn. There we go. Well, this one's gonna be harder to hold still while I tighten. So now I got I can put this and engage this gear and put this other gear on. And they use the same bevel gear for all locations here. Here again, there's another washer behind here. And I've got these loose so I can actually sneak the bevel gear in, I believe. I might have to take this the rest of the way loose. And that bevel gear does not have a screw or anything that holds it in place. It's just uh, trapped. So now these are, this will be trapped in between both bevel gears once I tighten this all back into place. gonna snug it up. I'm not gonna get crazy tighten it up yet until I know it's where I want it. There isn't any backlash there. Fits in there tight. Let's stand it up. Let's see what we got. Now we do have both sides moving at the same time. I'm gonna actually get in here and see if I can measure to the blade when I crank it up. It's cranking up like it should now. I can't kind of see my hand moving in the shot here, can you? But yeah, I'm cranking it up here. 
Feels like it moves freely. No resistance. Doesn't seem like anything else is bent or broke. Look coming all oh listen to that. My furnace just kicked on. Isn't that awesome? Working like it should. Now I can get up under here and take a look at things and get some measurements to see. Uh, how parallel this cutting edge is to the granite plate. That'll be important. Okay, what I did is I took this precision ground angle block I have and I ran it across the top of the granite and I could clearly see a significant difference between the blade height on one side versus the other. And it looks like about an eighth of an inch. So with that being said, I can take, since each revolution of this moves the blade about a sixteenth of an inch, I'm going to disengage this so I can move the screw independently of one another. Bring that down. Then I should be able to take this handle. Whoops. Make sure it ain't turning anything else. There we go. I should be able to take and bring this down. One, two turns and re-engage everything. We'll see how much impact that has. We may have to do this several times to get this timing back right again. And it's nice knowing that each turn of the screw is a sixteenth of an inch because then I can go in increments, quarter turn, half turn to get minor adjustments done. Now I'm going to look at it again. And what I've been doing is setting it down flat. So now I've got it so it all moves together again. And I'll put this in here and take a look at the blade. Once I get it to where I want it, I'll show you what I'm looking at. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to show you here what I'm trying to adjust. As you can see, i got the light in here. Let's see if I can get it to stay for a second. As you can see here, there's a gap here and not there. And as I slide this along, you can see how the gap gets quite a bit wider. Hey, my furnace kicking on again. Anyway, there's a lot of gap there now. So... There's a heck of a lot of gap there. I've got to come down, oh golly, three sixteenths to, or more, maybe even a quarter of an inch. That's how much difference there is in the blade height. So let's, so let's do that one more. close now uh, the gap is very small we're within feeler gauge range so now I can actually take and measure between the blade and the block with a feeler gauge to see what a little more than 20 thousandths there I'm gonna say we're off half a turn because if each one of these turns is a sixteenth of an inch that's 0.062 30 thousandths or 31 thousandths would be one half of a turn so let's make one half of a turn adjustment and We'll think we'll have it then. The game when you're playing with a planer, and this particular one, I was looking it up. You can't cut anything less than a half inch thick. Don't cut anything less than 15 inches long. This is 20 and a half. And don't do anything that's wider than 12 and a half. So this fits the bill. It's a nice piece of wood that I want to run through here and see if I can... Let's see how flat it is. Because I'm really curious how flat it is from side to side. How the thickness of it's parallel. This will tell the story.
All right, that cleaned that board up pretty good. I could actually go deeper and get more out, but I've got enough here I can measure side to side. And let's see what we got. Seems to be working just fine. Let's see what we can check for measurement here. We got one inch 992 there. One inch 986. Not real close, within six thousandths on a piece this wide. Now this is wood, so I don't know how much, I don't know how accurate this is actually supposed to be, but within six thousandths seems pretty good for wood. All right, folks, we've covered a lot of ground in this video from the thermostat to the electricity consumption to the planer fix to the fixing the on off switch on my shop vac to putting up a corner shelf to cleaning up and organizing. We've covered a lot of stuff. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if there's anything particular that I might be working on that you see that I might be working on that you want more detail on, don't be afraid to ask. I might be able to give you more of that detail. Uh, like I said, we're, I'm just, uh, uh, I guess I'm mechanically inclined, just kicked on again, mechanically inclined kind of guy. And, uh, and I like to work and tinker on stuff. Something I just thought of is I set that thermostat up. You can set the plus or minus degrees on it so that when you set the temperature, it'll go up to a plus a quarter degree, minus a quarter degree uh, for the on off. And I actually went and selected an option. It was plus or minus one degree, which is kind of interesting. Because right now when it kicked on, it's at fit. I got it set at 60. And it came on at 59, it'll shut off at 61. It doesn't seem to cycle too much at that setting. And uh, plus or minus one degree is not a big deal. So anyway, played around with that. Anyway, lots of good stuff going on. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Stay tuned for the next video. I don't know what I'm gonna be working on next. I've always got lots of projects. The old red beast right here may be my next victim. Uh, I don't have any reason why I don't work on it this weekend. I've been putting it off. As you can see, I refinished the whole garage around it. I need to get this thing done so I can get it back on the road and start making it my daily driver. So, you guys have fun out there. Enjoy life. Tinker on things. Have some fun. Get out there and enjoy it. I don't know how many times I have to tell you guys to enjoy it, but do it. And uh, with that being said, Michael out.